Well, I am extremely excited about this lesson because I believe it can actually help you. Um, what I mean by that is that it's practical. It can actually make a difference in your life and help you um, be a better person, a better follower of Christ because of what we're going to talk about. What we're going to talk about is motivation. And we're going to talk about having major motivation in your life. Uh, motivation is the idea that everybody's familiar with. Mo uh, a motive is a reason that you act. And so um, everybody knows what it means to be motivated. Everybody knows what it means to not be motivated. But if you do anything well, if you're going to be successful, you got to be motivated. Um, an example of motivation happened just recently in our family. When we started having to put sermons online, we tried to create a YouTube channel for Hunters Creek Baptist Church. And so to have a YouTube channel, to have your own name on your channel, you got to have 100 people subscribe to your channel. And so um, I didn't want to try to get 100 people to subscribe, so I told my 13-year-old son, I said, that's your job. I'm delegating that to you. You need to find 100 people to subscribe to our YouTube page. Well, I knew if he was going to actually do it, he was going to be motivated. So I told him he'd get $2 for every person who subscribed, up to 100. So for about three days, he worked his tail off to get 100 subscribers. And he got it. And he got $200. And after he got 100 subscribers, he has not touched it since then because he's no longer motivated because he doesn't get any more money. And so motivation makes all the difference in the world. Um, motivation about eating healthy, going on a diet. you got to have a motivation to begin a diet. Then you got to have motivation to stay on a diet. And so um, the same thing is true in Christianity. You have to have motivation to begin to follow Christ. Why would I turn away from my sins to live a holy, righteous, godly life? Why would I do that? That's a big change. That's giving up my old lifestyle. And then why am I going to continue to do that? What's going to keep me on the path? What's going to keep me from going back to my old lifestyle? And so you need major motivation. If you're going to try to, and, and, and as a Christian, we have this little saying, you fight the world, the flesh, and the devil. If you're going to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, you're going to have to have major motivation to ever change and definitely to stay on the right path. And so I'm going to just share with you, and I'm going to try to keep this as brief as I can, share with you um, the 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 little saying that I created that reminds me of what my motivation is as a follower of Christ. And so I, I, it's just a simple little saying that I use. It comes from the Bible. It's very biblical. And I'm going to use verses to support this. This is what I say in my own life. I do it for him, for them, and for me. Okay? Now, I've, I've shared this before, but it's, it actually works for me to think about this. So why am I trying to, number one, why do I follow Christ? And why do I try to do a, the best I can as a follower of Christ? I certainly fall short, but what is my motivation? I do it for him. That means I'm doing it for the Lord. I do it for them. That means I'm doing it for other people. And I do it for me because I win when I follow the Lord. It brings about the best life I can possibly have on this planet. And so I'll just elaborate on those points for a couple of minutes here. First thing, I do it for him, okay? Um, that, that's, that's number one on the list for a reason because that's the heart of Christianity. The heart of Christianity is I'm going to, there's a verse, I quote this verse all the time, 2 Corinthians 5.15. Or 2 Corinthians 5.14, Paul said, Christ's love compels us. Then he says in verse 15, because we're convinced that one man died for all of us. Therefore, those of us who live should no longer live for ourselves but for the one who died for us and rose again. So what Paul's saying is it's the love of Christ that compels us. And what does that mean? It means that Christ died on the cross for us. Therefore, we should not live for ourselves. We should live for the one who died for us and rose again. So the whole idea is that what Jesus did for us on the cross, when he died for my sins, that's going to compel me. That's going to motivate me. That's going to push me. That's going to spur me forward in trying to live my life, not for myself anymore, but for the one who died for me and rose again. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 9, and he said, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The gift of eternal life that comes through Christ, the gift of forgiveness, uh, the gift of being um, uh, adopted into God's family, 
My sins being forgiven. The Paul said that's an indescribable gift. And the reality is that should motivate us to say, you know what? What the Lord has done for me is unbelievably gracious and kind, and I'm going to try to live for him because of that. Um, there's a little Bible verse, 1 John 4, 19. It says, we love him because he first loved us. So that's, that explains how Christianity works. We love the Lord because he loved us first. And so I, I have another little saying. I have a lot of little sayings I use that when I think about what the Lord's done for me, okay, and this is what the Lord offers anybody. The Lord gives you life. The Lord gives you blessings in life. The Lord gives us new life as a follower of Christ. And the Lord gives us eternal life because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. So God has loved me. I'm, I'm blessed to have life. I'm, I have a lot of blessings in life. Um, I have a new life as a follower of Christ. And I have received eternal life. So that is motivation to say, you know what? I need to, I want to try to honor the Lord. I want to live a life that pleases the Lord. And I, I'm doing it first and foremost because of what he's done for me. Um, when the Ten Commandments were given, a lot of people are familiar with the Ten Commandments, but the Ten Commandments actually start this way. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the house of Egypt. You should have no other gods before me. So before God even gives them a commandment, the first one is you should have no other gods before me. He tells them, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the house of Egypt. See, what, and, and if you know that Bible story, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. Um, they were basically being abused, physically abused, tortured, having to work like dogs. They called it the iron furnace. They were in just a nightmare situation. But God brought them out of that and brought them into their own land and blessed them, gave them a land flowing with milk and honey. And so what he's saying is, Look, I brought you out of the house of Egypt. You should have no other gods for me. That's the motivation. We love him because he first loved us. And when you understand in your heart what God has done for you, when you feel that you owe everything to the Lord, that every blessing you have comes from God, and that registers in your mind and heart, then that is going to motivate you to live a life that brings honor and glory to the Lord. It's the least we could do. There's a little Bible verse. Romans 2, 4, it says it's the goodness of God that leads us to repent. In other words, it's when you, when you feel, when you receive the goodness of God, it changes your life. It changes the direction of your life. It changes your heart. Uh, Mother's Day is Sunday, and I have a great mom. I have a great wife, too. My wife is sitting in here with me, so I can't brag on my mom too much. I've got, I've got the best wife in the world, and I've got a great mom, too. Uh, but growing up, we would give our mom a hard time sometimes. There's me and my two brothers who are twins. They're two years older than me. So there's three boys about the same age, and we gave her a hard time sometimes. Uh, we'd get her upset. We would <laughs> get under her skin. She wouldn't be happy with us. And there was this speech that she had that she would give us. It was always the same speech when she got mad, when we, when we had um, <laughs> not acted like we should. It was the same speech. And a lot of y'all might have heard this same speech before. She would say something to this effect. I can't believe that y'all would treat me that way after everything I've done for you. And then she would go through this list. This, it's like a 10-minute list. I cook for you. I clean for you. I wash dishes for you. I buy you food. I buy you clothes. I buy you shoes. I take you to baseball practice. I take you to basketball practice. And she would go through this long list of everything that she had done for us. And basically saying, how can you talk to me or act like that after all I've done for you? A lot of y'all might have heard that speech before too. <laughs> I think moms are pretty good at that one. <laughs> but here's the thing about that speech. It actually worked. When you thought about everything that she'd done for you, and she was right. She had done that for us. This is her Mother's Day present this year. <laughs> So she had done all that for us. She really had. And it made you feel bad after all you've done for me. I should treat you better. And it should motivate us to say, you know what? I'm sorry, Mom. I need to do better. 
That is the same way that Christianity works. When the Bible becomes real, and it's not just Bible stories and vacation Bible school stories, Jesus died for you. You shouldn't live for yourself. You should live for the one who died for you. Christ's love should compel you. We love him because he first loved us. So whatever we do, whether it's a, I go to church because that's what the Lord wants me to do. It pleases the Lord. I give to the Lord. I want to have clean hands for the Lord. I want to have a clean heart for the Lord. That's the greatest motivation and that's, that's, that's what should motivate us to say, I'm going to get on the right path, I'm going to change my ways, and I'm going to stay on this path for the Lord. The second thing is, you do it for him, then I say this, do it for them, for other people. Um, and, and this is, you, people say this a lot, it's so true. Um, what our actions affect other people, okay? Uh, Proverbs 10.1 is a sad little verse, really. It says, a wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son grief to his mother. What that means is if you live a foolish life, you're, you're hurting your own mother's heart. You're bringing grief into her life. And so why do, why do I need to live a godly life? What should motivate me to faithfully follow the Lord? Well, this, this, this should motivate everybody. I want to have a positive impact on other people. That is, that should be a motivating factor. So, Paul in Philippians 1 is writing about how he would prefer to die and go be with the Lord rather than continue living on this earth. And then he says something in Philippians 1.24. He says, but it's more needful for me to remain for you. And so what he was basically saying is, I'm still on planet earth so I can help other people. That's the whole reason I'm down here. Okay, And really when you start to understand what the Bible is really saying one of the key reasons we exist, we are on this earth, is to try to help other people. And so we need to do what is right and what is, uh, we need to be the best Christian to benefit other people. I can give you five good reasons why I should try to live a godly, righteous, holy life. Five reasons. I got this memorized. Bentley, Hudson, Tucker, Ace, Gentry. That's my five kids. Okay? It is just unbelievably important the way I act, the things I do, the things I don't do to influence them. I have seven nieces and nephews. I'm the pastor of a church. I, I speak in a few different places. My actions, what I do or what I don't do is going to influence other people. And here's the reality. My life and your life, we can be one of two things that we are a positive example that helps other people come to know the Lord and get on the right path or we are a negative example that turns people away from the Lord and creates confusion about what a Christian even is. A lot of people, I mean, there's some people that are great role models and other people, they're terrible role models and they are really creating confusion. People will say something like, well, well, my, my Uncle Bill's a Christian and he cusses all the time and he drinks all the time. He's got seven DUIs. He's a Christian. Uh, so, well, people say this. Well, my, my papa's a Christian and he never goes to church. Well, you know what that's doing? And, and we, it's just being honest. It's creating confusion in what it means to be a follower of Christ. Um, our life, our actions, our words can have a detrimental effect on other people. Jesus told the Pharisees, you're not entering the kingdom of heaven and you're shutting the door in other people's faces. What he meant is, look, you're not, you're not following Christ and you're preventing other people from following Christ. And it's tragic but true that our conduct can do that. Um, our, we, we, there's no doubt one way or the other you're influencing your family tree. Um, the Bible says in Exodus 20, it talks about in the middle of the Ten Commandments that the sins of a father influence down to the third and fourth generation. Um, it's making a difference. And here's the reality, that I, I'm going to be dead soon. Um, I, I don't have that much longer. I'm almost 40. So um, 50 more years is about what I got. I'll be dead and gone. What's going to be left is going to be my kids and my grandkids. And the things that I've taught them, the things that I've showed them, hopefully they can then pass on to their kids and grandkids. And what, what is it we're trying to do? I'm trying to live a life that helps them see what it means to know the Lord, to follow the Lord, to serve the Lord, and to love and help other people. That is the motivation. For their sake, 
to help them see the right path. Um, I, a lot of people know this song, this Christian song, I Can Only Imagine. It's written by Bart Millard. Um, he's the lead singer for Mercy Me. And um, that song, there's a movie based on that song, I Can Only Imagine. It's a very good movie. If you want to watch that movie, it's got a great story behind it, the song. But he also wrote another song. This is my favorite song he ever wrote. It's called Maw Maw's Song. Okay? And it's a song that he wrote about his grandmother. And I've got it memorized. I can usually say it. I hope I can say it today. Um, he talks about when he was seven years old watching her sing at church. And it goes like this. Seven years old, up on my knees, on the third row pew, trying to see my grandmother singing the sweet by and by. It wasn't the sweetest sounding thing, but there's something about the way Grandmama sang that moved your feet, stirred something up inside. To see her grin from ear to ear, one thing was sure, it was very clear. This wasn't just a song, it was her life. See, he's talking about my grandma wasn't the best singer, my grandma, wasn't that, she wasn't going to be on the radio. But when she sang, you could tell this was her life. And it stood out in his mind. There's something different about this. And see, that's, that, that right there is leaving an impression on your grandkids. It's showing them, look, this is what uh, life is supposed to be about. This is what it is to know the Lord, to love the Lord, to follow the Lord. And so motivation is, man, I, and th th this is actually my motivation. And you might think it's garbage and it's not worth me sharing this. But I'm going to do it for him, for the Lord, and I'm going to do it for them. For not only my family, for other people trying to help them in life, trying to be an example, trying to help them know the Lord, trying to help them find the path of righteousness. And the last thing, I do it for him, them, and I do it for me. Um, this, is, this is just obviously true to me. I, I have no doubt about this from reading the Bible and from personal experience. The best thing for me to do with my life is to follow the Lord. It's not just the right thing, it's the best thing. Um, I love Psalm 23. Talks about the Lord is my shepherd. A lot of y'all might know it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. See, when I follow the Lord, this is true. What the Lord wants for me, where I'm going to end up is green pastures and still waters. That's, uh, that's where I want to be. Um, to the contrary, the Bible says in Isaiah 57, 21, there is no peace for the wicked. See, the, the man who's following the Lord, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. That means that God, that Jesus and, and our Heavenly Father are going to lead us into good places. Following the Lord is actually better for us. And I, I'll say this without hesitation, that when a person is engaged in sinful behavior, when they're selfish, when they're rebellious, they are hurting themselves. Um, it doesn't matter if they're 5 years old, 15 years old, 25 years old, or 55 years old. They are hurting themselves. And... Um, uh, Reminds me of a little story. I'll go ahead and tell this story. I wasn't planning on telling this story. There was a man who hated his boss. And he was just filled with anger and rage at his boss. And he was sick and tired of his boss at work. And he just, his boss was basically ruining his life. And one day he went into work and he showed, showed his co-worker, he pulled his shirt open and he had a bunch of dynamite strapped to his chest. And his co-worker said, what in the world are you doing? What's wrong with you? Are you crazy? Why don't you got dynamite strapped on your chest? And he said, well, I'm sick and tired of Mr. Jones coming and sticking his finger in my chest. Next time he sticks his finger in my chest, I'm going to blow his finger off. Well, <laughs> well what was the point of the story, okay? Uh, you can be angry and mad and you can live your life that way. And guess who you're going to end up hurting the most? Yourself. So when the Bible talks about being patient, being kind, forgiving other people, guess what? That's good for you. Being angry and bitter and jealous and, and, and having... Uh, rages, fits of rage, that is destructive in your own life. You're hurting yourself. Um, Ezekiel 18.30 says, Turn from transgressions so that sin will not be your ruin. Sin will ruin you. Isaiah, Jeremiah 5.25 says, Your sin has withheld good from you. Okay? So sin brings about negativity in our life. It is destructive. So I don't want, I want to stay on the path to follow the Lord. It's going to be better for me. Acts 3, 26, it says that Peter was talking and he said that the Lord sent Jesus to bless you by turning you away from your sins. See, the biggest blessing you have is getting out of your sinful um, um, habits, your sinful lifestyle. That's going to benefit and be a blessing to you. 
And it should help us know, I want to stay close to the Lord. The psalmist in Psalm 73, verse 28, he said, it is good for me to draw near to the Lord. It's good for me. That's going to help me. It's going to be better for me. There's hope, there's joy, there's peace, there's healthy relationships, there's security. It's better for me. Um, I, I was uh, telling my wife this a few minutes ago. She thought this was a funny story. But what if, I asked her, what if I resigned from Hunter's Creek? And I left her, and I left the kids, told them I was moving on to, to different things. I was, I was not staying with them anymore, and I was quitting my job. And I was going to Las Vegas to maximize my fun in Sin City. I was starting over in Las Vegas with the goal to have the maximum amount of fun I can have in Sin City. And what would that look like? It would look like casinos. It would look, Jennifer's in grin. It would look like casinos, wild women, alcohol, recreational drugs, and I just said, I'm going to live it up and live life to the full. What, what would be the result? Well, I can tell you what the result would be. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. My life would begin a vicious downward spiral. And in the end, I would be a big, fat loser. I don't know another way to say it. I would suffer and reap. Okay, so this is what would happen in the big picture. It would grieve God. It would grieve God's heart. It would grieve the Spirit of God. It would hurt. It would destroy my family. Um, it would just be devastating to them if I chose to do that. And I, it, I would suffer greatly in the long term because of my foolish decisions. So what I'm trying to say is this. It's better for me to follow the Lord. It's better for you to follow the Lord. Proverbs 22 says there are thorns and briars in the way of the perverse. So instead of green pastures and still waters, you're getting in a, a briar patch. It's not going to be good in the end. There's a passage in Proverbs. Just, there, there's so many things I could, I could say about this. I thought about this today. For a, a, a prostitute is a deep pit. And a seductress is a narrow well. That's what you end up in. It, 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 it's enticing. It's tempting. It's a deep pit and a narrow well. That's not where you want to be. That's not good for you. Proverbs 23, it goes on and says, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaint? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look at the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. See, who has low sorrow, contentions, complaints? Who, who is really miserable? Those who linger long at the wine. Those who go after mixed drinks. And then you know what? It swirls around smoothly in the cup. It looks good at the end. It bites like a serpent, stings like a viper. So I'm telling you this. What, 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 what is the proper motivation to begin following the Lord and to continue following the Lord? I would say I do it for him, for the Lord. I do it for them, and I do it for myself. You need all the motivation you can get. That's my motivation. And I will say this, 99% of the time, a lack of motivation is the problem. Now, people might think, oh, no, it's not a lack of motivation. I just can't do, I just can't, I can't do better. I, I, I got motivation. I just can't do better. Well, let me ask you this. Let's say somebody's an alcoholic. If I, if I promised you I'd give you $10 million if you were sober for a month, you think you could be sober for a month? $10 million if you're sober for a month. I imagine you'd be sober for a month. If I said, if I, I don't care if you're, if you're a drug addict. And I told you, you get $10 million at the end of a month if you're, if you're completely clean. I suspect you'd be able to put down the pills or, or, or stop sticking the needle in your arm. You'd have great motivation. If somebody's watching pornography, and I said, you, you go a year without watching pornography, I'll give you $10 million. They'd drop their phone in the trash can. They'd break every screen they had in their home. If they really bleed, i get $10 million if I do that because they'd be highly motivated. If I said if you if you can be if you if you can be the best husband uh, if you can win the husband of the year award, you get ten million dollars if you can be the husband of the year for one year. Guess what? Things would change around most people's houses if they thought I'm gonna get ten million dollars. See, motivation cures a lot of things. And I'm just telling you this: if you can grab hold of this, why do I need to live a godly, righteous, holy life? Why do I need to begin to follow the Lord? Why do I need to continue to follow the Lord? Because you need to do it for the Lord. You need to do it for other people, and you need to do it for yourself. That is major motivation. You need major motivation. Those things have to be real to you. 
um, that I'm either um, pleasing the Lord or I am grieving the Lord, the one who died for me. And I'm either helping my family and people around me or I'm leading them astray and shutting up the door of heaven in their face. And then I'm either bringing blessing into my life or I'm bringing destruction into my own life by my own habits. So I don't know where you are. I don't know how you're living today. I don't know if you're walking with the Lord, if you're far from God, but I know this. You need major motivation if you're going to change. Major motivation. People don't do things without being motiv motivated. And the motivation is to do it for Christ, do it for others, and do it for yourself. Um, you can change, and you can stay on the right path if you have enough motivation. Um, I hope that helps you. There's more motivation in the Bible. That's the things that I cling to. That's what I like to think about. And it really does help me. It's not just a sermon. It's not just a lesson. It's real life. Those things can motivate you to try to be the best you can be in life, to begin to follow the Lord and continue to follow the Lord. Love you. We're praying for you. We are. We had church this past Sunday at Hunter's Creek, 9 o'clock for those over 50, uh, 11 o'clock for those under 50 and those with kids. It was two good services. We had about half of our regular attendance. And so we're going to be back doing that this Sunday. If you'd like to join us, we'd love to have you. Uh, if, you, if you have questions about it, you can call me or text me, 706-499-4237, 706-499-4237. But we love you. We're here to help you. Uh, we're praying for you. Hope you are highly motivated to either begin following the Lord or continue following.